Good morning, and welcome to worship. Please join with me as we read Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8, responsively. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Our opening prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, strengthen us for the journey ahead through this time of worship. Impart on us a bold vision of how to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells us that we all know from our own lives that the world does not work the way that it's supposed to. It's broken, and this brokenness affects our relationships with God and each other. Unfortunately, we're unable to fix what is broken because we ourselves are broken. We call this brokenness sin, and as the Bible says, if we claim that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, God will forgive us. Once forgiven, our relationship with God is repaired, and the basis for repairing our relationship with each other is established. Let us spend a few moments together now and confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. Father in heaven, we are broken and need your help. We ask you to forgive whatever sins we have committed. Guide us so that your forgiveness overcomes our broken lives. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is merciful, and so I say unto you this day that your sins have been forgiven. To make sure that you know your sins are forgiven, God's own Son, Jesus Christ, gave up his life on the cross for you. So let go of the burdens that weigh you down and give them to Jesus and celebrate this new opportunity that God has given you. Amen.
Please join with me in our prayer of the day. Lord God, you call people from every nation into your presence. As you gather us together, let us truly be your hands at work in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading today comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1-8. through 8. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some baked bread on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through chapter 5, verse 2. With the Lord's authority I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Word of God, Word of Life. I will never forgive her for the way she treated me. The 4th of July celebration that I had in 1986 was no celebration at all. It was just a big test of my frustration level. My name is Matt Sewer. I, I grew up in a small town uh, northeast Iowa called Decorah. 
And I, I now reside in Altoona with my wife and am starting my final year of seminary classes uh, this September to graduate in May. So just thank you so much for inviting me to come and, and share this message today. I did, I did chat with some folks and you, I believe you had Mark Vanderteig here a month ago or so. He was my senior pastor for many, many years. And so if, if, if I'm you know, negative in any way, we'll just blame it on Mark as, <laughs> as the influence that I had growing up. But, but that summer after my high school graduation, it was a fun one. And it was supposed to be a celebration. And, and my buddy Russ and I, we had a double date. And we were heading out to the fireworks in Spillville, which is another small town near us. Now, I don't remember the name of my date at all. I, I, I'll freely admit that. Uh, you might understand why here in a little bit. But we're just going to call her Kelly. So if anybody is in here named Kelly and I disparage the name, sorry. This is going to happen. Uh, but we were about 30 minutes into the evening. And she walked over and, and asked if I would like to have a drink with her. And well, one, I'm just out of high school. I'm not a drinker anyway. I was driving the car that night, so I politely declined. No, I don't, I don't need to have a drink with you. Well, about 30 minutes later, Russ looks over and nudges me and says, hey, isn't that Kelly over there? And sure enough, she had found somebody who would have a drink with her, and they were kissing. So. Yeah, that was a good thing. Um, I don't remember anything else about that evening. I did chat with Russ and, and said he had some other friends that were there. And he said, yeah, I can get a ride home. And so I walked up to her and said, enjoy your evening. I'm heading home. And I left her there. And that was the point in time where I said, I can't forgive somebody who just has no idea about just general human decency. But see that kind of feeling that I had in my gut? did nothing for her, right? It only affected me. It affected my well-being, but it, you don't want to let go of that. Um, Ephesians 4, 31 talks about that feeling, and it says here, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. God forgave you. And that bitterness and that anger and that rage that can be on both sides of the equation, right? She certainly was probably angry about the way that I just dismissed her invitation. And that was probably her motivation for doing what she did. But it's clear that after the event, I held on to my own bitterness and my anger and my rage. And at the time, I, I wouldn't have even known that these scripture verses existed. I didn't, I didn't accept Christ until I was 30 years old, uh, 23 years ago. And so at this time, I wouldn't have known any of this stuff. But now hindsight can tell me that me holding on to that bitterness and that rage, that was a sin in my own life. But man, as humans, we want to hold on to that because it's something to grab onto. And we do it even at the expense of our own health and our well-being. But we're going to fast forward a little bit. So my first year of college, which I attended in that same town, Decorah, Luther College, in case anybody knows about Luther, go north. Um, who do you think I'd run into when I was downtown one evening? <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> now, I hadn't seen her since the 4th of July. And we're in, it's maybe three, four months later, so I'm in my freshman year of college. But I've still, all summer, had had this ugh, feeling. And she was downtown with no ride home. Now, the right thing to do is to not ask her what incredibly poor decision she made this time that left her with no ride downtown, but rather to just say, can I give you a ride home? It's 15 minutes outside of, outside of downtown Decorah. I can do that. But I still had this tugging that said, you got to get rid of the bitterness. And I could have done it privately, but this face-to-face -face encounter, which I now see, again, hindsight, that God set up for me to have this encounter with, with her, I hadn't seen her since the 4th of July, and I haven't seen her since that day that I gave her a ride home. But I was able to tell her that I hated the way that she treated me. 
but I forgive her. Gave her right home. Never saw her again. But I tell you, my inner being was so much more at peace than what it was before. And that unforgiveness, that sin of unforgiveness that I now see was a sin, was something that I needed to have God forgive me for. I'm holding on to this stuff. In Psalm 32, 5 talks about that. I acknowledged my sin to you, did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And that's what Christ offers to each one of us, no matter what the sins are, right? Whether we're the one that did the sinning or we were the one that was sinned against. Jesus lived, died, was buried, and was resurrected to forgive us and to free us. And that's what we get to celebrate every day. Every day we get up. We've got bread, we're forgiven. Every sin in our lives, every sin in the lives of the believers, every sin in lives of non-believers. Jesus took them all. And the other thing we like to do as humans is, is put human emotions or human attributes on God. And it, it, might, it might give a little picture. It's never a complete picture, right? God is so much bigger than that. But in this instance, I, I, I imagine that human side of God. If I think of the bitterness that I had, the anger, and that each one of us has, and I multiply that by a million and a billion, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He said, I'm taking all of that on the cross. And his human side felt all of that bitterness and all of that rage and all of that anger and all that unforgiveness. And he held it there. But then the divine side won out as he said, it is finished and released the pain of that sin and that forgiveness and he set us free. So simply put, we, we need to forgive because of what Jesus' example was. We have been forgiven. F forgiving somebody isn't saying that, that that pain didn't exist or that it didn't matter, it didn't hurt. We're just choosing not to hold it against anybody anymore. And maybe more importantly, we're not going to let it affect our own being because like Kelly, she had no idea. She had no idea that it had bothered me for that long. So when you think about forgiveness, there are a few things to consider. An apology from the offender is not necessary for forgiveness. I don't think she ever apologized because she didn't know. She might have after I said I hated her or hated what she had done. I, I don't know which way I said it. <laughs> it was too long ago. But if an apology comes, that better be a trigger for forgiveness. If somebody's going to apologize to you, then you, there's no doubt about it. As Christ followers, we need to say, we're sorry. Now, the other way around, if we're the one that maybe left somebody in a state of unforgiveness, when I think about the state that I was in and how I was feeling, if I know that I've left somebody in that state, I better get over there and offer my forgiveness. Second thing, forgiving somebody doesn't have to be spoken to them. My occasion, God set it up and I was able to do that and, and thank God for that. But there are times where maybe the person has died and you're still holding on to that. The only way to get closure is to, gonna, with an open, honest heart, offer that forgiveness. And then maybe the final, final thing on that is, depending on the depth of the pain that was felt, it might be months, days, years, any variety of length of time. But I can say that holding on to unforgiveness that long is really gonna do nothing to the other person. It's gonna be more hardship, bitterness, anger, and just that ugh feeling in the gut. And in fact, it's terrible for our health. Uh, you can get headaches, 
our bodies don't rest and rejuvenate and repair themselves. They don't, you don't heal properly. I mean, even, something as simple as a, as, a, as a pulled muscle. If you're holding on to unforgiveness and you've got that other ick feeling, it's going to take a lot longer for that thing to heal. Your, your body, God put together an awesome body and, and it all goes together. Forgiveness is just going to lead to better health. It, there's medical studies that show holding on to unforgiveness can increase these things here. Depression, raise blood pressure, cause anxiety, heart disease, and lower your self-esteem. That does not sound like a fun way to go through life. All because I want to hold on to this uh feeling because somebody did wrong to me. That's no way to live. And we're going to look at one more piece of scripture. It's, uh, it, it's from the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus shared this piece in Matthew 5. It's 23 and 24. I did a couple of quick ones because I thought maybe somebody was going to read them and I didn't want to have to have her read the entire book like she did earlier. But I got, I got, a, I got a short one here. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Now, Jesus was speaking of this Jewish tradition and the instruction that they had to bring sacrifices to the altar. And more so, he was talking to those people that are going to do that as a checklist of this is what I have to do. This is just, oh, I got to do my offering today, check it off, bring it to the altar, good to go. And he's saying that's not what this is about. It's not about that checklist. It's about checking your heart. And if you're going to come and leave a gift, get your heart right first. Not get your entire life right, but get your heart in the right place. Getting our heart right with that earthly relationship that, that, that's not going right is going to lead to that much more deep of a relationship with Christ. We're not going to be perfect. Jesus knows we're still sinful human beings. But man, reconciling those earthly relationships, it's a model for exactly what the Holy Spirit does on our behalf with our relationship with Christ. So maybe there's one more story I need to share, and it was another time where God lining things up. The week that I was writing this sermon out, I had an interaction with somebody that didn't go very well. Um, my wife and I in January started attending a, a gym, and we've been introduced to this whole new family of people that we didn't know as of you know eight months ago. And that group of people is they're they're so confident in themselves they're so encouraging to everybody else uh, it's just a place where it doesn't matter what your body shape your size what your goals are whether you look fit or not none of that matters if you're there to better yourself it's a place of encouragement and confidence and support and every person that i've interacted with there seemed like that was the case now, the other thing you may have picked up a little bit is I, I kind of like to find funny things and I can find humor in about any situation. And this one woman, she's pretty short in stature. Uh, we'll just say it that way. Um, and she was sharing a lot of funny stories about her upbringing, uh, phrases that she would say and things that she believed, even, even into her adulthood. That's just lobbing a softball up to me right there. So I, I started poking some fun back at her. Now, her husband who is uh, probably four inches taller than me, and like I said, she's here. We were chatting, and I offhanded make, made some joke about them being unequally yoked because of the size difference and the differences there. And, and it, was, it was funny, and we laughed, and we moved on, and, and he's like, yeah, but she offsets so many aspects of me, and completely understood. She didn't hear that part, but she heard me say unequally yoked. So she started questioning that night. Is there truth to those words? Am I really less than? Am I really not as good as my husband? Is, 
it brought back all these things that she had from her upbringing. And there was, there was abuse. There was all the stuff that I had no idea was under the surface of who this short and extremely confident person was. She had family struggles that were going on. She was always told she wasn't good enough. And that, what I said, was a trigger. Now I do praise God that she actually found the courage to track me down. Uh, we weren't Facebook friends yet, but she friended me the next day and in the afternoon, she sent me a big message and, and told me a little bit about that. I had no idea. And I was completely unaware of what I had done. And so I, as we should, if we hear that we did something like that, we need to apologize. And we ended up having some really good conversations about life, uh, her faith, which she's a fairly new Christian, just figuring this stuff out. And I did end up catching her at the gym um, a couple weeks ago and just let her know that, that, that God actually timed that unfortunate interaction that we had with the exact same time that I was putting this sermon together. And that I was going to be sharing it. Um, if she hadn't been able to approach me and ask me about that, I could have put her in a terrible place. And that just, that just that possibility kind of brings up that angst again, but I don't have it anymore because we've talked about it so many times and, and she's now confided in my wife and, and it, she had a problem trusting people and now she's shown that she can trust people and she can share things with folks. And so she's growing, I've grown, but I could have ruined a relationship and, and personally probably ruined a, a person so the confidence that I thought I saw did resonate a little bit that she was confident enough in herself to ask me and approach me. And for me, shame on me for, for making an assumption about, about someone who just seems confident on the outside, but everybody probably still has a trigger that can set them off. And this is where that gospel reading that I, that I read kind of really hit me. Verse 23, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, it was almost as though the sermon that I was putting together, the words that I was writing down were going to be a gift. But as I'm writing them down, she, she approached me. And there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Now leave those gifts at the altar. Go and be reconciled. And then come and offer the gift. And so I did. For a week, I set the preparation aside while I dealt with this issue that I had. And I had to address it as soon as I heard about it. Because if I hadn't, my heart would not have been in the right place to prepare the words that God wanted me to speak. So what does this mean today? Is there unforgiveness in your heart? Have you wronged someone, but maybe pride is causing you not to admit it? Well, we all can ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, guide our words, guide our actions, guide our attitudes, guide our heart as we work through these things with God helping us out. I'm going to look at that example that Jesus said when he hung on the cross, right? In addition to saying, it is finished. He said this in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Even in the midst of that worst pain and anguish, bitterness, unforgiveness that he was feeling, he was all about forgiveness. Even to those two soldiers who were gambling to try to see who was going to get his possessions. Jesus offers us that forgiveness each and every day. And that's what we get to celebrate, that we are forgiven. And because we're forgiven, we also need to forgive. 
And with that as our example of forgiveness, how could we ever, ever utter those words? I will never forgive you. Lord God, just thank you for Thank you for those godly encounters that you give us every day. Thank you for putting people in our lives that help us to practice your forgiveness. Guide us and help us to forgive those who we've wronged and to release the unforgiveness that we have in our own hearts toward anybody who's wronged us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we gather today asking to be heard. Open our hearts and our minds that we may hear and feel your presence. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. As the summer continues, we pray for all that travel far from home. Keep them safe and bring them home to those that wait. Grant peace and fair weather to those that are close to home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all people throughout the world, for all leaders in every country. Give them strength and guide them that peace can be shared by all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those that serve to protect our country, our state, our town, and our homes, we ask that you keep them safe in your care. Let them know they remain in our prayers always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for word of life and those within that search for the true path for our future. Grant wisdom and patience to your continuing guidance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in pain or conflict. Touch their bodies, minds, and souls, granting the peace that only you can give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we go forward, continue to hold each in your hand. Guide each of us to serve you as you would want. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father in heaven, you created us in your image. When we fell, your son came to lift us up. In this meal, we not only remember what Jesus did for us, but through faith we receive the forgiveness he promises to us. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. Now let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Please join with me as we pray our closing prayer. Lord, we pray that our time here will bless and guide us in the week to come. Plant your word deep in our hearts so that it will be a path before us. 
leading us to walk in your way so that we are a blessing to those around us. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.